Wunderbar. So, I left off on this slide on the plasma membrane. We talked about the plasma membrane, guys, gals, as something that helps control what goes into and out of the cell. A lot of times, when we look at the plasma membrane, we can think of it as a selectively, oh, that's not good. Hold on a second here. Ha! Ah, I promise I didn't touch anything. Okay, we're there. Okay. Let's go back to here. I have no idea what happened. Magic. So when we think of the plasma membrane, a lot of times that plasma membrane is described as a, and I, and I quote, a selectively permeable membrane, end quote. And the idea behind that is that it lets some things in and go in and out. Other things, it stops from going in and out of the cell. One of the ways it does that is with our phospholipids. I think I covered this slide last. Transmembrane proteins. Yeah, I covered that. Here's where I left off. Membrane proteins. Start presentation. So we talked about the phospholipids. Um, we talked about the cholesterol that helps make the membrane more rigid. Some things, though, guys, gals, have a really hard time going through that lipid barrier because of those hydrophobic fatty acid tails on the phospholipids. So to get big things in and out of the cell, we're going to use proteins. And the proteins, you know, because they're exciting, these proteins in the membrane can be broken up into different categories. We can have integral proteins. These integral proteins are going to go all the way through the membrane. Um, you can think of them as the proteins that are on the intracellular side and the extracellular side. Um, as we look at these integral proteins, the amino acids that make up these integral proteins are both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, or hydrophilic and hydrophobic. And we need amino acid side chains that like being exposed to water and that do not like being exposed to water for these proteins to stay in the membrane. So as we look at these integral proteins, the part of the protein that is towards the surface, either the extracellular or the intracellular surface, those amino acids that are exposed to water are hydrophilic. They like being exposed to water. But the amino acids that are right here in the middle of the phospholipid bilayer, those amino acids are the hydrophobic amino acids, and they preferentially are going to stay embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. Now, if we have a peripheral protein, the difference between the peripheral and integral protein is peripheral proteins are on one side. So they'll either be extracellular or intracellular, depending on the protein. So as we look at this protein, something, actually both of these proteins, I want to emphasize for you that on the intracellular side, these proteins are bound to part of our cytoskeleton. And because they're bound to that cytoskeleton, they are anchored relative to the cell. And because those proteins are also anchored in the plasma membrane, this is how the cytoskeleton can help determine the shape of the cell. These membrane proteins help the phospholipid bilayer, the plasma membrane, to interact with the cytoskeleton and determine our cell shape. We're going to camp on this topic for a while. There are tons of proteins or kinds of proteins in our plasma membrane or cell membrane. Some of these proteins are going to receive signals and then amplify them into the cell. Some of these proteins are going to serve as digestive enzymes on the surface of the cell. Some proteins are going to let stuff go in and out freely. Other proteins will let things go in and out of the cell only when exposed to the correct signal. And then other proteins are going to serve to either identify the cell or to anchor the cell in position. So we have identity, we have anchoring, we have selective permeability, we have constant permeability, we could also have chemical digestion or signal amplification. These proteins in the plasma membranes can do many different things. So let's talk about the proteins that are receptors. These receptor proteins are going to take an extracellular signal 
And that extracellular signal will bind to the receptor protein, and that receptor protein usually changes shape. When we have the signal, that chemical molecule that's in signal, physically binds with the protein, new chemical bonds form, and as new chemical bonds form, electrons are shifted around, and the shifting of electrons causes the protein to change shape. A change in shape causes a change in function, and as that protein changes shape, it will then amplify the signal inside the cell, some kind of a secondary messenger chemical. And that's where the second messenger systems come in. We'll talk about those in more detail later. Um, there was a Nobel Prize in 2017, don't quote me on the year, recent, a recent Nobel Prize went to a University of Minnesota Duluth alum for his study of these secondary messenger signals and their healthcare applications. A lot of these proteins are going to be enzymes, so proteins that speed up or catalyze chemical reactions. Sometimes um, they'll be extracellular, sometimes they'll be intracellular peripheral proteins. Uh, particularly though we have a lot of these in the digestive system um, that help us to digest food as the food is moving through our small intestine. And then we have a lot of channel proteins. As we look at these channel proteins, sometimes they're always open, sometimes they open and close, based on the voltage, the electrical potential energy across the cell membrane. These are called voltage-gated channels. They're very important for our nervous system and muscular systems. Some are going to be ligand or chemically-gated systems. So when you see a ligand-gated channel, um, that's kind of an old-school term. Uh, the newer term that's being phased in is chemically-gated channel. So when you see ligand-gated, you can put in parentheses next to that, chemically-gated. It's just a, a protein channel that opens and closes when exposed to the correct ligand or the correct chemical. And then we have mechanically-gated channels. Right now, your mechanically-gated channels are opening and closing. And when you interpret my sound waves, my, the voice leaving my mouth, will physically open and close mechanically-gated channels in your ear, and that's how we take a physical sound wave and turn it into an electrical signal that we can process in our brain. There's all kinds of ways of opening and closing those proteins. We have carrier proteins. These carrier proteins will attract some kind of a solute, and when I say solute, I mean some kind of a chemical dissolved in solution, and help it get across the membrane. Usually, the, these carrier proteins are going to move solutes against their concentration gradient. So they will concentrate a chemical inside of the cell or outside of the cell. And because these uh, carrier proteins are moving something against a concentration gradient, they require the input of chemical energy, the input of ATP. When we think of our cell identity markers, those are typically going to be extracellular proteins with some carbohydrates attached to them that serve to identify what kind of a cell we're working with. And then when we think of cell adhesion, those are going to anchor or bind one cell in our body to the next cell in the tissue. Um, the two most common anchoring proteins are collagen and laminin. So let's talk about the amplification of signals. These are known as G proteins, or G-coupled uh, cascades. And when we look at these G proteins, this is a very broad category. Um, there are whole textbooks dedicated to G proteins. Uh, you can find a textbook about just anything, though, so that's not saying much. But when we look at our G proteins, guys, gals, these are proteins that serve to take some kind of a, a small, weak signal on the outside of the cell, and transmit that signal to the inside of the cell and make it a very strong and powerful signal on the inside of the cell. Now these signals that are pick up, picked up are usually going to be some kind of a signaling molecule that's hydrophilic, that likes to be dissolved in water. And because it's hydrophilic, it doesn't get across the cell membrane. It can't move through that phospholipid bilayer. So we'll have, let's just say we have some kind of a protein-based messenger. That protein-based messenger binds to our G protein, and the receptor receives it and changes shape. Once the receptor changes shape, there's going to be a intracellular G protein released. That intracellular G protein is then going to move across the intracellular side of the cell membrane and then attach itself to adenylyl cyclase. 
And this is an enzyme that turns ATP into cyclic AMP, or CAMP. So it's an adenosine monophosphate with a circular or cyclic structure. And this cyclic AMP, or CAMP, is then going to move around inside the cell and activate proteins, so the, these, whatever the protein is. And this is where we're going to be vague, and this is where the differences come between the G proteins. We'll have that inactivated protein be exposed to cyclic AMP. It becomes activated and then starts to phosphorylate other proteins, turns on enzymes, and we talked about enzymes already. Enzymes can be reused and recycled over and over and over again. A very small concentration of an enzyme can have a very profound effect on the chemical environment. So just by activating a couple enzymes on the inside of the cell, these G-coupled proteins can cause a dramatic amplification of a signal. Of the secondary messengers, cyclic AMP and calcium two-positive ions are by far the most common secondary messengers inside of our cells. And when we look at pharmacology, most known drugs that we know the mechanism of, and that's a big caveat, because a lot of drugs out there, we don't know how they work on a molecular basis, but for the ones that we do, most of the ones that we've discovered are actually going to work through G-coupled protein cascades. It's a big deal for those of you who are pre-farm majors. Let's talk about the outside of the cell membrane. On the outside of the cell membrane, or plasma membrane, we have some carbohydrates. These carbohydrates form what is known as the glycocalyx. And this glycocalyx is kind of a fuzzy external coat. These carbs are going to absorb water molecules via hydrogen bonding. And these water molecules are then going to help cushion and insulate the extracellular matrix of the tissue. These carbohydrates that are in the glycocalyx can also serve to identify the cell. When we look at the carbohydrates in our extracellular matrix, from human to human to human, we have different carbohydrates. The only time they're going to be identical is with identical twins. And also within your own body, from a liver cell to a muscle cell to a stomach cell, different tissue types within the same person are also going to have different carbohydrates on their surface. These carbohydrates do three primary things. They help identify what kind of tissue or what kind of cell you're working with. They help to identify if it's your cell or a foreign cell. And then finally, they help to absorb water molecules. When people are having uh, thyroid issues, thyroid problems, one of the reasons why individuals with hypothyroidism t tend to retain a lot of extra water in their bodies and swell up and gain weight rapidly is because they produce more carbohydrates in their glycocalyx. And as they have more carbs added to their glycocalyx, those carbs will bind to more water molecules and cause that person to feel bloated and put on a lot of water weight. So let's move on to microvilli. This is an extension of the cell membrane that we've been talking about in lab this week. A key thing about the microvilli is that it's going to be a folding back and forth of the plasma membrane. It is pretty stinking small, one to two microns in length. So these guys are not big. You typically, in our microscopes in lab, need to have the microscope turned up to 400 times total magnification, and then you're just barely able to see them at 400 times total magnification. But the nice thing about these microvilli is because they cause the plasma membrane to fold back and forth on itself repeatedly, they cause a dramatic increase in the surface area of the cell membrane. And as we have a dramatic increase in the surface area, we're able to increase the rate of absorption. So when we think of microvilli, think of them as a way of maximizing the rate of absorption of the cell membrane. Now, within our small intestine in particular, um, these are going to form what's known as a brush border. Our small intestine is where we absorb most of the nutrients that we consume. So we have tons of microvilli in our small intestine, particularly in the duodenum and jejunum of our small intestine. And we'll have membranes embedded in the cell membrane, or excuse me, proteins embedded within the cell membrane that are digestive enzymes. These are referred to as brush border enzymes. So not only do these microvilli in our small intestine help us to absorb the food that we eat, the enzymes 
within the plasma membrane of the microvilli also digests the food that we eat. We'll talk about that in more detail next semester when we get to the digestive system. Um, moving on, talk cilia. In human beings, cilia are never used for locomotion. Now, if you take microbiome, cilia are used all the time by bacteria to get a bacterium from point A to point B. But in humans, we never use them to move our cells around. We will only use cilia to move something past the cell. And that's a key distinction I want to make. We use cilia to move substances past a cell, not to move individual cells, or not to have locomotion of an individual cell. So in our respiratory tract, we have a lot of mucus. We use cilia to move the mucus out of our lungs, out of our trachea, to clear mucus out of our respiratory tract. Uh, for those of us who have a uterus, we use cilia with our uterine tubes to move the egg to the inside of the uterus, or to take that ovulated secondary oocyte and get it into the main body of the uterus. When we look at our brain, we have hollow spots in our brains, and that's a good thing. We all need some hollow space in our head. Um, there are some empty spaces I like to refer to it as. And these hollow spaces in our brain are called ventricles, and they have fluid circulating through them, and we use cilia to help circulate fluid within our ventricles of our brains. So as we look at these cilia, we need to emphasize that these cilia are going to beat freely with a saline layer, typically right at the surface. And this is important because if we have an issue with the ability to move sodium or chloride ions, this is going to influence the saline layer. Um, if we don't have enough water directly next to the cilia, or this, this salty water, the saline layer, the cilia tend to get clogged up. Uh, medically speaking, this is pretty significant. So let's say everything's working perfectly. We can move the sodium, if we move the chloride ions around appropriately, we have the salt water layer of our cilia that causes the cilia to move around freely, and then the cilia can move mucus, secondary oocytes, or whatever the heck it is, our body is trying to move that, those cilia and that particular tissue. If somebody has cystic fibrosis, though, they don't have the correct chloride balance of their saline liquid layer. And by not having that correct chloride balance, by having a mutation in their chloride pumps, they aren't able to move the chlorine of the sodium chloride solution to the correct spot. That causes the saline layer to get really thin. And the cilia tend to get choked and clogged with extra sticky mucus for individuals that have cystic fibrosis. What does this extra thick mucus do? Well, in the pancreas, the, somebody who has cystic fibrosis will have a tough time releasing digestive enzymes from their pancreas into their digestive tract. In their respiratory tracts, individuals with cystic fibrosis have a very hard time getting mucus out of their lungs. Um, I went to school with somebody who had cystic fibrosis, and um, this was in the early 2000s, and as a high school student, she had to spend a half an hour a day tilted upside down on a vibrating table, a half an hour morning, half an hour night, so an hour a day, vibrating upside down to physically shake the mucus out of her lungs. And that's the only way individuals with cystic fibrosis can really clear that debris from their lungs. They have a very tough time doing it, and in particular, individuals with cystic fibrosis are prone to lots of pneumonias or lung infections. Um, life expectancy is pretty short. Last time I checked it was mid-20s um, for individuals that have cystic fibrosis because if you can't get snot or mucus out of your lungs, it's going to be really hard to breathe and get oxygen into your bloodstream. And if you can't get oxygen into your bloodstream, all kinds of things don't work well in your body. So cystic fibrosis, it's a big deal. Let's talk about another extracellular extension, the flagella. Flagella is a plural term. Um, I should really put flagellum up on the screen, screen, though, because we as human beings will only ever have a single flagellum on any of the cells in our bodies, and particularly the, the males in the room that produce sperm. Human sperm cells are the only cell in the human body that have a flagellum. And as humans, if it's a properly functioning sperm, it will only have one flagellum. 
Um, as men age and they have more mutations to their sperm, you'll see non-functional sperm with maybe two or three flagella, but those are the duds. They never make it to the goal. Um, so good sperm will only have one flagellum. Now, as we look at a flagellum, unlike cilia, which are to move a substance past the surface of a cell, flagella don't move substances. Flagella are for locomotion. They move the sperm cell. So this is a way that the sperm can move around within a female's reproductive tract and hopefully get to that secondary oocyte and fertilize it. Now, when we look at this, the flagella, the flagella itself is a very long extension of the cell. It's much, much larger, larger than the cilia and much, 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 much larger than those itty-bitty tiny microvilli. Sometimes, particularly when we're looking at white blood cells or leukocytes, we can have a pseudopod form. I want you to circle pseudo as a prefix. That prefix pseudo means false or fake. And then the root word pod, P-O-D, circle that in your notes for those of you who are handwriting things. Pod is a root word that means foot. Think of a podiatrist or a foot doctor. So a pseudopod in root words means false foot. And when we look at a cell pseudopod, it's an extension of the cell membrane as the cytoskeleton is reforming that causes the cell membrane to either move the cell around. So pseudopods can be used for locomotion, or the cells can form pseudopods to engulf solid objects or foreign material that doesn't belong in our body. Uh, most of the time when we see pseudopods form, they're going to be in human beings at least with the white blood cells, the leukocytes, either for locomotion or phagocytosis, swallowing bacterium that don't belong in our bodies. I mentioned it at this at the beginning of the presentation, but it's in writing because it's super important. Our plasma membrane, our cell membrane, is selectively permeable. Some things go in and out, other things are blocked. Now, there are different ways to move things in and out of the cell. We can have passive or active transport. Passive transport, as its name implies, does not require effort. It just happens automatically. So passive transport, because they don't require effort, excuse me, don't require ATP. No input of cellular energy is needed for this passive transport. So what powers passive transport? What makes it happen if we don't use any work for it? Passive transport is only going to be powered by concentration gradients. So chemicals will spontaneously go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this is an example of um, what powers passive transport. If you've ever taken a can of spray deodorant and sprayed it in your bathroom, you probably notice how that smell can go out into the hallway or go into the next room. That's the, whatever that odor molecule is, going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration as it diffuses through the atmosphere of your bathroom. When we look at active transport, active transport is going to move a chemical against its concentration gradient. Active transport requires the input of energy. It's an active process. When we think of active transport, think of it as something that will concentrate a chemical. It can concentrate a chemical inside of the cell, or it can concentrate a chemical outside of the cell. And there's two kinds of active transport. We have direct active transport, and we can have vesicular transport. We'll talk about those in subsequent slides. In addition, we'll also talk about carrier-mediated transport. This is probably the single most kind of active transport we can have in our cells. Carrier-mediated transport is when the cell is going to selectively transport chemicals that bind surface proteins by invaginating the plasma membrane. Let's talk about these in more detail. <coughs> so as we look at Filtration. This is the most common passive transport out there. And there'll be some physical pushing force. This physical pushing por force that moves a particle p through the membrane is called hydrostatic pressure. Or another way to phrase it is reverse osmosis. Um, 
So as we look at this, we have, think of our blood pressure. We typically have, you know, 120 over 80 milliliters of mercury is your cutoff or standard blood pressure. That pressure in your bloodstream will push water out of your blood vessels into the extracellular cavity of your tissues in your bodies. This is going to allow not only the water, but a lot of small nutrients to be transported from the bloodstream to the tissues of our body. They are literally pushed out of the arterial side of our capillary beds where we have really high blood pressure. And then to look on the reverse, in areas of low blood pressure in our bodies, because we have low blood pressure in those particular areas, we have the bloodstream absorbing water and absorbing nutrients from the extracellular cavities. So not only does this allow for us to deliver nutrients, it also allows for us to remove stuff from our tissues as well, depending on the fluctuations in blood pressure. So, we can have simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is, well, as its name implies, it's the simplest. That's the deodorant in your bathroom example that I gave you. If you take a drop of dye and put it in some water, that dye will just spontaneously spread throughout the water all by itself. Um, this is due to something known as Brownian motion, where we'll see particles just bouncing around randomly, colliding with each other and diffusing and spreading out. This simple diffusion is always going to be powered by concentration gradients. Molecules will spontaneously go from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Very, very few things in nature are prone to spontaneously concentrating themselves. They do exist in very specific situations, but that is absolutely the exception to the trend. Almost everything will go from an area of high concentration and spontaneously dilute to a lower concentration. When we look at plasma membranes, that substance, whatever that substance is, can only move through the membrane if it's permeable to the substance, if the membrane allows that substance to move through. And this is where the cell membrane becomes very important. It will let something spontaneously travel across it. Other things, it prevents from spontaneously going across the cell membrane. So, what are some things that influence diffusion? We'll be looking at these in lab next week with some of the experiments we're setting up for you. Temperature influences diffusion. The higher the temperature, the more collisions there are going to be, the faster the molecules move, and the quicker they will diffuse out. Molecular weight is another thing that influences diffusion. Larger molecules move slower than smaller molecules. So the bigger the molecule, the higher the molecular mass, the slower the rate of diffusion. Think of little kids versus adults. Adults generally are bigger and they typically move slower and don't diffuse as quickly as little kids. When we think of concentration gradient, and we say steepness, this is the relative change in concentration. If we go from a super duper high concentration to a low concentration, that's a big difference in concentration. For those of you taking chemistry, I'm going to use a term called molarity or molar. It's just a unit of concentration. If I go from a 10 molar to a 1 molar environment, that's a big change in concentration. But going from a 1.1 molar to a 1.0 molar solution, that's a very small change in concentration. So by having big differences in concentration, you can cause something to diffuse really quickly. Membrane surface area is another one. The more surface area there is, uh, the more chemical can go through the membrane. You can think of it like doors. The more doors we have in a classroom, the quicker somebody can go in and out of a classroom. And then we also have membrane permeability. And that's going to influence the ability of individuals to go, or individual particles to move through the membrane. So if that particle is highly permeable, it can travel quickly through the membrane impermeable molecules, uh, I'm thinking of like a big fat glucose molecule. Those things have a very hard time traveling through the plasma membrane and have low solubility and low rates of diffusion. Something else in our body that's important is the diffusion of water. And water is such a big deal in our bodies that we have a special term for the diffusion of water. This special term for the diffusion of water is called osmosis. 
and a lot of students um, get hung up on osmosis. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Water goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, just like any other chemical. The thing that throws students for a loop is that water is usually the solvent as opposed to the solute in solution. And because water is the solvent, um, a lot of students struggle with thinking of it as a solute. We typically have a solute-centric point of view as opposed to a solvent-centric point of view. But if we think of water in terms of the constant, just a molecule, like any other molecule, here on side A, it has more water than on side B. And the reason for that is because we've dissolved a whole bunch of something. I don't, it really doesn't matter what it is. Maybe I dumped a bunch of sodium chloride. Maybe I dumped some potassium, potassium permanganate, just some random chemicals on the other side of the membrane. That chemical is stuck on side B. It's lowered the relative concentration of water. So water will tend to preferentially have a net movement towards the direction where there's a lower concentration of water. Once osmotic pressures have equalized out, the net movement of water from one side to the other side has equalized out, and there's no change in the relative volumes of water. Um, well, as we look at this process of osmosis, here's a key thing we need to emphasize. Osmosis is a pulling force. It tends to pull a liquid across a membrane. For example, if we look at the top of the screen on side B here, we are going to draw water towards side B. Water is going to be pulled towards side B with osmotic force. And then to get water to go back to side A, we have to push it back to side A with hydrostatic pressure. We'll talk about that in more detail next semester. So when we think of osmosis, it's really important in terms of maintaining fluid balances in our body. When you're administering medication via IV, if there's too high of a fluid concentration or salt concentration in that fluid, you can cause osmotic imbalances in a patient. You can cause that patient to have water drawn into their bloodstream and cause them to have incredibly high blood pressure. You can cause water to be drawn out of their red blood cells and cause the red blood cells to shrivel up. That's called crenation. Um, after lab last week, a student in this room came up and talked to me about how a nurse made a medication error. She put a decimal point in the wrong spot and gave that individual student three times, I want to say three times or 300, I forget the number, um, gave that student way too much potassium in an IV drip and induced two heart attacks in that student. It's a big deal, super big deal. Getting osmotic pressures correct with IVs is literally life and death. Now, in our bodies, our cells have a special protein called an aquaporin. These aquaporins you can think of as a water hole. Aqua for water, pore for hole. And those allow things to move across the cell. Very quick, water move across the cell. Now, as we think of osmotic pressure, again, it's the pulling force. It's going to pull something across the membrane. Hydrostatic pressure is the pushing force. It physically will push something across the membrane. In your house, some of you may have a reverse osmosis filter under your kitchen sink to give you drinking water. All a reverse osmosis filter is, is a membrane that is powered by the water pressure in your house, and it pushes water across, the, the natural water pressure in your house pushes water across the membrane to filter it. It's just filtration, but it's jazzed up, and they call it reverse osmosis, because it technically is. It's the opposite of osmosis. It's the pushing force, and it gives you cleaner drinking water. So let's talk about how to quantify osmosis, because if osmosis is such a big deal, we need to be able to communicate osmotic forces and osmotic pressures clearly and effectively. When we think of osmosis, we, the, the unit of osmosis that we use is called an osmolar. So it's very closely related to molarity. So think back to your chemistry prerequisite. The molarity of a solution is the moles of solute divided by the volume or the liters of solution, total solution volume. 
Now, some things that you dissolve in solution are going to remain as discrete individual molecules. I go back to glucose frequently because it's such an important molecule in our body. When you dissolve glucose in, our, in water, it remains one glucose. One molecule of glucose stays as one molecule of glucose. Other things in our bodies don't remain as one discrete molecule. For example, calcium chloride um, has a dramatic bang, gives you a lot of bang for your buck with osmolarity. One formula unit of calcium chloride, CaCl2, will turn into three ions when dissolved in solution. So we will take the molarity of calcium chloride and multiply it by three because calcium chloride forms three dissolved particles. So that when we calculate osmolarity, you take the number, the molarity of the solution multiplied by the number of dissolved particles, whatever that is, chemical is, forms when it's dissolved in aqueous solution. So when we think of a one molar solution of glucose, one molar glucose is the same as one osmolar glucose because it's a one-to-one. -one. When we think of sodium chloride, there's a sodium, there's a chlorine, one molar sodium chloride gives you two osmolar sodium chloride. As we look at our own body, though, and for the record, there will be no calculating of osmolarities in this class. Um, take pharm for those of you going into pharmacology, you'll do it then. Um, this is something worth committing to memory, though. It may or may not be on the exam. And this is the natural osmolarity of our bloodstream. Our blood is naturally going to be at 300 milliosmoles per liter, or milliosmolar is another way of talking about it. So, in terms of solutions, a 0.9% sodium chloride solution is the same as a 300 milliosmolar solution. So that's why when somebody's giving saline via IV, it's always going to be 0.9% saline solution. When somebody's giving glucose via IV, um, it's not going to be at that regular milliosmolar concentration, but it's pretty close. And it's going to be a 5% mass mass glucose solution. Let's talk about how concentrations um, relative to each other, relative concentrations can be categorized. We can have hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. If we take a red blood cell or any kind of a cell in our body and put it in a hypotonic solution, that solution is going to have almost no dissolved salts in it. And because it has almost no dissolved salts in it, it's going to have a very, very low milliosmolarity or osmolarity. And consequently, those cells will suck up fluids from those hypotonic solutions because hypotonic solutions pragmatically speaking, are almost pure water. They have very high concentrations of water. Um, back in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, when there were looser ethical considerations for college labs, a standard lab activity was to take a tadpole and throw it in a beaker full of deionized distilled water and watch the tadpole swell up and the cells of its body would burst. We don't do that one anymore. And then we have hypertonic solutions. And when we think of those hypertonic solutions, they are going to cause cells to have water leave the cell. And these hypertonic solutions have high saline or high dissolved ion concentrations or a high osmolarity. And a good example of a hypertonic solution is just going to be soda pop. Drinking pop or soda, and depending on where you are from in Wisconsin, maybe you call it one or the other, drinking those carbonated sugary beverages actually dehydrates you because the concentration of water in those beverages is lower than the concentration of water in your bloodstream. They actually pull water from your blood into your digestive tract. Another classic hypertonic solution is seawater. And I know, like, the idea of being in the ocean right now is really appealing when it's negative 10 in the morning. So let's just all, you know, pretend we're on the, a tropical beach. Now, you're thirsty. You don't go for the ocean to drink the ocean. Drinking the ocean is a terrible idea because the ocean has a 
sodium chloride concentration. Our blood is 0.9% sodium chloride. So drinking ocean water, or what we commonly refer to as salt water, will actually dehydrate you. It will draw water out of your bloodstream into your digestive tract and give you mild diarrhea as it dehydrates you. And then we have those isotonic solutions, that 0.9% sodium chloride. And when we say isotonic, that refers to the same tonicity or the same osmolarity. With isotonic solutions, there's no net movement of fluid one direction or the other across the membrane. Let's talk carrier-mediated transport. Carrier-mediated transport is very energy intensive. The idea behind carrier-mediated transport is that we will have membrane proteins, peripheral proteins on the outside of the cell. First, we need to make the proteins, then we need to deliver the proteins. That alone uses up a ton of energy in and of itself. And now we have these proteins hanging out on the outside of our cells, on the extracellular side of the cell membrane. Those individual proteins will start to pluck their favorite molecule as their favorite molecule is drifting past the outside of the cell. And after, so I, I always think of like going to the apple orchard. After you grab an apple with one hand and an apple with the other hand, you can't hold any more apples. You have two apples for two hands. And these peripheral proteins will start to pluck the molecules from the extracellular environment. After they're fully loaded, they will all group together. And then we'll have all these extracellular proteins that are saturated with their favorite chemical, whatever their favorite chemical is. They'll huddle together on the outside of the cell, and then they'll pop to the inside all at the same time. This is known as invagination. It's a form of phagocytosis, and, or actually penocytosis. And as we're looking at this process, it uses up a ton of energy. So why would we, as physiologically lazy organisms, because we don't like wasting energy at a physiological level, why on earth would we invest so much energy for so few molecules? Because when we think of like, when we're talking hundreds or thousands of molecules, that's nothing. Usually, when we look at molecules, you don't care until you get to the trillions or quadrillions of those molecules. So why would we invest tons of energy to get hundreds or thousands of molecules? Well, to answer the question, these are very important molecules. Think of vitamins. We typically have low concentrations of vitamins in our body. And these vitamins are hard to concentrate. These are molecules that are very difficult to move against the concentration gradient. And this carrier-mediated transport is one of the only ways we can get sufficient concentrations of these micronutrients into the cells of our bodies. Now, we should emphasize specificity. Different surface proteins will grab different molecules. So we'll have a specific surface protein for a specific molecule, depending on what kind of carrier-mediated transport we're working with. Something else to emphasize is, is the saturation rate. Um, this ability to move the proteins across, the molecules across the protein are going to be influenced by the relative concentrations. If there's lots of your favorite molecule in the extracellular environment, you can dump more of your favorite molecule to the intracellular environment. At a certain point, though, those extracellular proteins become saturated. And those saturated proteins are moving their favorite molecule as quickly as they can. And once we reach the transport maximum, we can't move the molecule any faster. Increasing the relative concentration will have no effect on the rate of diffusion. Um, a classic example, and I, I'll, I'll use this one this semester, I'll use it again next semester, is glucose in your urine. When we start making urine in our kidneys, we have a bunch of blood sugar enter our urine, enter the filtrate. And it's not a good idea to urinate out sugar. It's a great way to get a urinary tract infection to have sugar in your pee. And it's also a waste of energy. We want to keep the sugar in our bodies. We're programmed to do that. But individuals that have diabetes have such high blood sugar 
and they have so much sugar entering their urine that they can't get all the sugar out. They've reached the transport max of glucose in their kidneys, and they have leftover glucose in their urine that gets urinated out. Now, when we do these testing now, almost nobody gets their urine tested for glucose anymore. We have pretty sweet systems right now that give you a pinprick, and you can test the blood sugar directly. It's safe, it's reliable, and it doesn't hurt that much. Um, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have the patient pee in a cup, and you'd put a glucose test strip in the cup, and then measure the glucose concentration that way 30, 40 years ago. 100, 200 years ago, before we had handheld testers or before we had test strips, the doctor had to taste the urine directly. And if the patient had sweet urine, well, there must be sugar in the urine. You must have diabetes because it tasted good when I drink your pee. I love technology. So, as we look at carrier-mediated transport, the way you're know, using these proteins to get something across the membrane. There's different flavors of carrier-mediated transport. We have uniport. When we say uniport, uni means one. Uniport carriers move only one chemical. We can have symport carriers. These are going to move multiple chemicals, and generally speaking, those chemicals are going to be in the same direction. Sometimes, every once in a while, you can mix and match these, but when we think of symport carriers, symport, uh, think of synonym. A synonym in English is a word that means the same thing as another word. The same root word in synonym is in a symport. It moves molecules the same direction. Um, in our urinary system, we use sodium concentrations in our kidneys to move glucose from the urine into our extracellular fluid. We also have antiport. This is going to take two molecules and move them in opposite directions. By far the most common example of this is the pota sodium potassium pump. This sodium potassium pump is one of the most common antiporters in our body. It uses up about one third of our total caloric intake. Is this one antiporter protein, the sodium potassium pump? It's a big deal. As we look at all of these methods of carrier mediated transport, all these different ways of moving something across the cell membrane, we can have diffusion, so we can have the chemical moving across the plasma membrane with its concentration gradient. So a uniporter, uniport transporter, can just have the molecule go through a hole. Think of the aquaporin, the water hole. Aquaporins are uniport, and they're passive. So water will just passively go through the hole in the cell membrane, that hole made by the protein. Sometimes, though, we're going to have these tr protein transporters move something against its concentration gradient. And if it's moving the molecule directly, it's primary active transport. And that's when this transporter protein will grab its favorite molecule and move it directly against its concentration gradient. Um, an example of that would be the antiporter that I had mentioned here, um, the sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium pumps will physically grab sodium and potassium ions and directly move them against their concentration gradients. And then we could also have secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is going to move something against its concentration gradient, but it's not going to be powered by ATP. For example, we have that sodium glucose transporter. We use ATP with our sodium potassium pump to build up a sodium concentration gradient. That sodium concentration gradient is then used to power the sodium glucose transporter. So these secondary active transporters still require ATP ultimately, but they don't use the ATP directly. Instead, they'll use a concentration gradient built up by some other protein using ATP.
Let's talk about facilitated diffusion. Actually, I got ahead of myself here. Sorry about that. So as we think of facilitated diffusion, it's just going to be a molecule that needs a protein to help it across the membrane. And that protein, or excuse me, that molecule can then go directly through the membrane with its transporter molecule helping it get through. Um, just to reiterate again, facilitated diffusion does not require the input of ATP. It is a passive process powered only by concentration gradients. We have that primary active transport. I had mentioned the sodium potassium pump where we use ATP directly on the pump to move sodium ions and potassium ions against their concentration gradients. So as we look at these primary active transports, they use ATP directly to move a chemical against the concentration gradient. Now, we'll, let's spend a little bit more time on the sodium potassium pump because it's such a big deal in our bodies. Not only does it maintain sodium ion concentration gradients, it also will maintain potassium ion concentration gradients. By regulating these ions in our bodies and having these variations in sodium and potassium, we are going to maintain membrane potential. And when I say membrane potential, I mean the electrical charge across the membranes in our bodies. Our membranes, our cells are all electrically charged. And this is how electrocution kills us. When we get electrocuted, we have a strong voltage or a strong current that throws off all the voltages in our membranes, in our bodies. And if it's in nervous tissue or in muscular tissue, those cells in particular, those, very, those electrically active tissues, are very strongly affected by those electrical currents. Um, I typically electrocute myself uh, twice a year because I do a lot of wiring. And every time I get zapped, the, uh, it's usually in my hand, my right hand, because I'm right-handed. I'll usually have my hand clench up really tight because I'm activating the skeletal muscles in my hand when I get hit with that 120 volts. As we look at the solute concentration, think of, go, let's go back to osmosis. By changing in sodium and the potassium concentrations, we change osmolarity. And by changing osmolarity, we change the direction that water is pulled across the membrane. So these sodium potassium pumps are going to be directly responsible for influencing water balance in our bodies as well, or cell volume. And then finally, because the sodium potassium pump is using up ATP, it's taking one ATP molecule and turning it into two smaller molecules Going from a big molecule to a smaller molecule gives off heat. It's an exergonic chemical reaction. So we generate lots of body heat with the sodium potassium pump. Let's talk about secondary active transport in more detail. When we think of secondary active transport class, I need to emphasize two key things. First, it does not directly use ATP. And then second, it's going to move a chemical against the concentration gradient. So these secondary active transporters are fairly common, not as common as the primary active transporters, but they still are going to be used in our bodies to move our favorite chemical from one part of our body to another part of our body to help maintain correct concentration gradients. I'd mentioned it before, I'll mention it again, because it's a common one. I'll, I mentioned this multiple times throughout the semester. The sodium glucose co-transporter, where sodium and glucose are moved the same direction. It's a symporter because sodium and potassium go the same direction across the cell. And because glucose is going against its concentration gradient, it's a form of active transport. What powers the sodium glucose? transporter, sodium concentration gradients. So it's powered by sodium. It's a form of active transporter. And since it's sodium ions and not ATP, we call it a secondary active transport. So we take a sodium potassium pump, 
and pair it with a sodium glucose pump to ultimately move chemicals around in our bodies. One active transporter will provide the energy for a secondary active transporter. So primary transporter will power the secondary transporter. Here we have the sodium potassium pump directly burning ATP. Here we have the sodium glucose pump being powered by the sodium concentration gradient. Let's pause for a moment and have a review question here. So, there's the multiple choice. I pulled this review question from the practice quiz, which is currently available on Top Hat. So it may be familiar to a couple of you. Cellular membranes are permeable to blank, but impermeable to blank. So think about what can get across a cell membrane. This is a tough question. What things can easily move across a cell membrane? What things have a hard time moving across the cell membrane? Make sure you get your answers in. Um, it's okay if you answer incorrectly. Just answer the question so you get your participation. And then we'll talk about what the right answer is. So we are out of time. So as we think about this, there are a couple things that we have to look at to get something across a membrane. To get a chemical across the cell membrane, we typically have to deal with a phospholipid bilayer. Our phospholipid bilayer has hydrophobic fatty acid tails. These hydrophobic fatty acid tails of the phospholipid bilayer make it so that highly polarized things or hydrophilic chemical compounds have a very hard time getting across. Something else that makes it difficult for something to get across this cell membrane is the size of the molecule. Small molecules can fit between the fatty acid tails easier than ginormous molecules. And when we're thinking of ginormous molecules, they don't get much bigger than proteins um, in our bodies. We talked about those macromolecules. So as we look at our cell membranes, any small nutrient in our body can get across that cell membrane. So when we think of a nutrient, it's any chemical that's metabolically important. A lot of you, and we're, we use the common English term, we think nutrients are good, we want nutrients. Wastes are bad. But let's think of wastes, guys, gals. Wastes are made in the cell. If we couldn't get the waste products outside of the cell, they would just continue to concentrate inside of the cell and kill the cell. Waste products need to be able to go across the cell membrane very quickly in addition to nutrients going across the cell membrane very quickly. When we think of proteins, protein molecules are ginormous. They have a hard time going across the membrane. Phosphates are tiny, and they're also highly polarized. They have a hard time because they're highly polarized. Nutrients, we need to go across the membrane very quickly, but we've talked about proteins a fair amount now. They do not go across the membrane as a general rule of thumb. They have to be exocytized or phagocytized or endocytized. So let's talk about how we get those really big things across the, pro the membrane in more detail, like protein molecules, for instance. We have vesicular transport to get those really big things across the membrane that normally we wouldn't be able to get across the membrane. So. As we think of the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, it can fold in on itself or it can fold out on itself. This folding in or folding out will form a bubble or a vesicle. Uh, my molecular bio prof was Russian, and so instead of saying vesicle, she would say vesicle, and I always got a kick out of that. Um, 
As we look at this vesicular transport, though, not only are we going to take these bubbles of membrane or bubbles of phospholipids and move them in and out of the cell, we're also going to take this, this suitcase or this bubble that's the phospholipids and move it around within a cell as it's carried around on the cytoskeleton by motor proteins. These motor proteins that move the vesicles within the cell are active transporters. They are going to burn through lots of ATP to get our vesicle from point A to point B. Now, if something is getting dumped outside of the cell, if we take a vesicle and we dump its contents out of the cell, that is exocytosis. Think of exo for out, cyto meaning cell. Exocytosis gets stuff out of cells. Exocytosis is pretty boring, though. Endocytosis has a lot more variety to it. So when we think of endocytosis, this is in cell. Endo for in, cyto for cell. And there's different ways we can bring things into the cells. We could have phagocytosis, pinocytosis, or receptor-mediated endocytosis. Let's talk about each of these in detail. Phag or phage means to eat, if you look at the root word. So when we have Phagocytosis, this is cell eating. Typically, think of cells engulfing solid particles or particulates. Pino means to drink. So when we look at this root word, pino, that means drink. Pinocytosis is cell, drinking cells or cells drinking. Uh, pino grigio, I think I pronounced that correctly. I'm not French, so don't... Uh, it's a kind of wine. It's drinking wine or drinking grape juice. So I always think of that, you know, that wine that I see at the store when I think of pinocytosis. So as we have our next one, receptor-mediated endocytosis, this is when we have very specific proteins on the surface of the cell grabbing specific molecules, and then after they grab those specific molecules, we'll have endocytosis occur. A classic example of that is going to be clathrin-coated vesicles inside of the cell. Um, here is an example of phagocytosis in action. So we have a solid particle. It gets engulfed by a pseudopod from the cell or a false foot. And then that phagosome or that solid particle is now inside of the cell. Now, just having it hanging out on the inside of the cell isn't that useful. We need to rip it apart to its individual molecules to use it up. And to rip it up into individual molecules, we have an organelle called the lysosome that will bind to the phagosome, digest the solid molecule, and then depending on what that molecule was, either we'll use that solid, those building blocks and recycle them in the cell, or maybe we don't want to use them and we dump them back out into the extracellular environment. As we look at receptor-mediated endocytosis, we'll see those very special molecules getting grouped together on the surface of the cell by receptor proteins. As those receptor proteins grab those important molecules, the, cell, the membrane invaginates inside of itself and forms a phagosome. And these particular phagosomes are typically going to have a lot of clathrin protein molecules on the surface to help identify them. Uh, as something that has gone through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, you may be familiar with LDL, this stands for low-density lipoprotein. An example of receptor-mediated endocytosis is our body absorbing these LDLs, or the, it's known as the good cholesterol, is what most people refer to this as, sucking up the good cholesterol from our bloodstream and bringing it inside of our cells. All right, we're at eight after. I have a couple minutes left still. So let's talk about transcytosis. Transcytosis is going to be moving across a cell. Trans, think of traverse or traversing. To go across mean, is the root word for tran. And then cyto meaning cell. So transcytosis is when we move something across a cell. We have exocytosis paired with endocytosis. So we can have a endocytosis on one side of the cell. That phagosome then moves across the cell, and on the other side 
there's exocytosis, and the chemical is dumped on the other side. Transcytosis is one of the ways that we help to control fluid cavities and fluid concentrations in our bodies. This transcytosis is particularly important when we want to very tightly, very closely regulate what fluids are going across the membrane because those fluids have to be picked up by the cell, monitored by the cell, and then transported to the other side of the cell. And this is a very active process. It consumes a lot of energy, so it's not incredibly common uh, because it's so energy intensive. During this process of exocytosis, secreting something from the cell, what we find is that our phagosome, our secretory vesicle, our big phospholipid container will fuse with the cell membrane. As it fuses with the cell membrane, its contents are going to be pumped out of the cell. And here is a scanning electron micrograph of that process in action of exocytosis caught in the split second it was occurring. It's a pretty cool micrograph. Let's move on to the cytoskeleton. Our cytoskeleton is a rigid framework in our cells. This rigid framework of protein filaments is going to give our cells shape. It helps to give us orientation to the cell. It helps to organize organelles within the cell. <coughs> and it helps to dictate the movement of the cell, the formation of the pseudopods, the endocytosis, the phagocytosis, those solid particles. Within our cytoskeleton, there are three kinds of fibers that make it up. We have micro, well, actually there's multiple kinds, but the most common three are microfilaments, intermediate fibers, and microtubules. We've spent a fair amount of time in lab this week talking about microtubules as they relate to mitosis and the rearranging of duplicated and unduplicated chromosomes within a dividing cell. As we look at these three most common filaments, the microfilament as its name implies, it's the smallest. Micro meaning small. Microfilaments are made of a protein known as actin, and it's particularly common within our skeletal muscle cells. As we look at intermediate filaments, they're a little bit bigger. Our intermediate filaments are going to be made of a protein known as keratin. This keratin protein um, is particularly resilient. It's very well known for resisting stress or torsional or tensional forces on the cell. So when we think of the skin that, or our epidermis, the cells on the surface of our skin, or our hair, or our fingernails, toenails, these are cells that have lots of intermediate filaments, that have lots of keratin, and these are very tough cells that can resist lots of stress or physical forces. And then we have those microtubules. Our microtubules are the largest at 25 nanometers in diameter. Our microtubules are going to be formed from the centrosome, which is a part of the cell, a region of the cell that we mentioned verbally in lab, but it's not on your lab objective sheet, even though we do talk about it in lab and expect you to know it for lab purposes as well. And as we look at the centrosome, it's going to make not only the microtubules, but it's also going to make these intermediate filaments and the microfilaments. And when we think of microtubules, they give us the shape of the cell, they help to hold organelles in place, and they help for many different things, including mitosis. As we look at a microtubule in detail, a microtubule is a hollow collection of hollow tubes. And then as we look at these microtubules, there's different variations of the microtubules. We can have a single, a double, or a triple. And depending on our needs, we'll see these variations within our bodies. Um, as we look at internal structures of our cells, we have more than just the nucleus and the, the cytoskeleton and this plasma membrane. We have lots of accessory internal structures. All of these internal structures that have specialized functions are going to be referred to as organelles. And we have two broad categories of organelles. Organelles with a membrane and organelles without a membrane. Our membranous organelles are the most common, and there's a lot of membranous organelles. 
We also have some non-membranous organelles. Ribosomes are the most common non-membranous, but we have the centrosome, which is made of two centrioles, um, and we also will have a couple basal bodies associated with that as well. But of those non-membranous organelles, ribosomes are by far the most common. And we have less than 60 seconds left in class. Nucleus is a good stopping point for today. So we'll leave off on the nucleus. I'm going to put a big fat star right here. So that's my visual cue to start up on this slide on Tuesday. How far did we make it? Ah, so close. 